Advanced Life in Relentless Pursuit of Leadership Excellence. Hello, my friend. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come your way through this telecast. This has been specially put together with you in mind. Whatever your situation is as you listen, know that you are on God's mind. Whether it's for empowerment, a business move, spiritual growth, wisdom to make decisions, this is just for you. I just want you to sit back and relax and just get into this word and I know that your life will never be the same. Enjoy. Psalm 47, Psalm 47, Psalm 47, beginning from verse number 1, Psalm 47. We're going to learn another dimension of worship, praise. Psalm 47, verse number 1. Oh, clap your hands. <laughs> oh, clap your hands. Some of you peoples. Is that what it says? Oh, clap your hands, half of the congregation. What does it say? Clap your hands. Oh! How many is all? All means is everybody included? Is somebody excluded? The Bible says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. <laughs> he is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us. Which means you don't have to go on Facebook to insult the one who is troubling you. You do your do and let God do his do. <laughs> and the nations under our feet, he will choose our inheritance for us. The excellence of Jacob whom he loves. God is gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belongs to God. He is greatly exalted. Amen. Amen. We've been looking at, let the worshipers arise, and we've been looking at different dimensions of worship. And today we are going to look at one part of worship and its implications. Remember sometime last week when we were teaching, we determined that when we get our praise or we get our things vertically right, horizontally things will begin to work out for us. You remember that? When you give it to him first, you give it to him. Sacrifice it to him and see what he can get back to you. We said, the songwriter said it this way, that when the praises go up, I can't hear you at all. So when the uh huh. Hallelujah. You see, we, we learned last week that worship stems from our hearts. But also our bodies are involved in worship. The great apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Last Sunday we talked about sacrifice of praise. A living, not a dead one. He doesn't say, listen, go and be a martyr. Go and let ISIS kill you. Then that's sacrifice. No. A living sacrifice. And in the Old Testament, when people brought sacrifices to the priest, so long as you had your bull, so long as you had your goat, so long as you had your turtle dove or whatever you brought to the tabernacle, so long as your hands had it, it was yours. But the moment you handed it over to the priest and he took it to the tabernacle, it was over. It never belonged to you again. So when you present your body to God as a living sacrifice, 
This thing you have said, Lord, belongs to you. Everything within me is yours. Everything that you have given to me belongs to you. If you ask me to kneel, I will kneel. If you ask me to cry, I will cry. If you ask me to roll on the carpet, that is what I'm going to do because it belongs to you. God wants you to be physical. There should be expression in our worship to God. Anything that is powerful, anything that brings a breakthrough, the enemy fights it. Have you realized that? When we come to the issue of prosperity or money issues, the enemy fights it. There are so many doctrines. Have you realized that? And when it comes to the issue of worship, there's a fight. Because sometimes people live in posit, they sit on their high chair and they say, oh, after all, all this loud praises and clapping is cultural. It's for people who are from a loud culture. <laughs> Have you realized that? Oh, yes, I, I, lived, I lived in the United Kingdom. You know, there's something called the British stiff upper lip. I used to believe them until I saw them at the football stadiums. So the stiff of our life belongs to Jesus. And the cheers belongs to 11 players trying to kick a bag of leather across a white goal line. We got something wrong with this whole picture. No doubt too many people are depressed in that nation. Some even people say like, listen, the people praise. The reason why some people praise, you see, when people are needy, it's for poor people. Oh yeah, I've seen that. That all this praise and dance is for when you get rich, you don't even mind praising. Some even go as far as to say, listen, all this praise business, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But if you study your Bible without bias, if you take off your denominational sunglasses and look into the Bible, you will not fail to admit with me that praise, worship is expressive. Amen. We express ourselves and it has benefits. And today we are going to look at, at them and that is going to be the burden of this message. It's in verse number one. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God. Clap and shout. Why do we clap and why do we shout? Let me give you a little background. Let me set the scene for you to understand. Psalm 47 is one of the psalms, psalms written by the sons of Korah. You know, David didn't write all the psalms. Asaph did his part, but of course, David had the majority. But Asaph, the sons of Korah, they were different people. They did their part. And the sons of Korah were a group who were steeped into praise and worship. That was their thing. It was a family thing. And Psalm 47 in Israel was used to announce the break of a new day. Anytime a new day is breaking or they were entering into a new season, uh, what will happen is that they will clap their hands and they will shout to summon in the new season. When they did that, they were indicating that a shift was taking place. Because when there's darkness and daylight is coming, it's a shift. Somebody here, I don't know who it is, you need a shift. Because weeping has endured for a night. But you need a shift to come in the morning. And in order to announce the shift that is coming, you clap your hands and you shout to announce that something is about to take place. If you want to move into a new season, uh, the prescription uh, is a clap. Because your clap, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and your, your shouting uh, initiates the work of God uh, in your life. And here the Bible says that when Israel did that, uh, God goes up with a shout. That is, God shows forth on your behalf. Uh, when you announce, when you shout, when you clap in triumph, uh, you are energizing something around the throne of God. And God begins to just show off and begins to show forth and throw his weight about for you and so if I were you I would take some five seconds yeah you may be seated you may be seated let me give you four reasons why we clap our hands four reasons why we clap our hands number one it is an act of celebrating a victory it's an act of celebrating victory, but there's something, there's a catch. You see, for many people, they clap their hands, they applaud after something has been done. When somebody sings, when somebody scores a goal, when somebody does a slam dunk, people clap. 
When a team wins, people clap. But in the kingdom of God and as a people of faith, we don't clap after the victory. We clap before the victory because faith anti- <laughs> I said faith anticipates the victory. So in the midst of your darkness, in the midst of your trouble, you clap your hands in order to tell the enemy or whatever barrier that I have anticipated my victory and I am calling the thing Number two, clapping is an act of establishing covenant agreement. Wherever you clap or you shake hands, because when you look in the OT, you realize, Old Testament, that is, that any time an agreement is cut, a covenant is cut, people strike hands. They can set up a stone, they can pour oil on it, they can pour blood as a blood sacrifice, but after that, they strike hands. Which means, when we as a people of God, when we strike our hands, uh, we are saying that our covenant with God, or whatever he's saying to us, let it be yes, and let it be amen, and let it be that I agree with you. And so when you clap your hands, uh, you are making a statement uh, that whatever God has said to you, it is so, and we agree it. Number three, clapping. I want somebody to clap and let me hear something. Okay. It's a reminder of legal occupancy. Let's say you have a house and one day somebody shows up at the house. You know your mortgage is paid. Your rent is paid. You don't owe anything. And somebody comes and says, I own this house. What are you going to do? I, I like that you slap the person. That's nice. It's also clapping of clapping of hand and cheeks, but that's okay. <laughs> sometimes you know you have to. Some of you are too laid back, but you have to fight sometimes you know? because that might be a physical demon. So you deal with them physically. <laughs> but chances are that you go get your the papers to your house and let the person know that I am the legal owner of this house. Jesus says something in John 10 and 1, John chapter 10 verse. He said, he that enters the sheepfold by another door, the same is a thief and a robber. But the one that enters by the door, he is the shepherd. Jesus was contrasting something. Listen, you and I were born, the sheepfold according to the Bible, it's the earth. That is why you find sheep. The Bible says that we are the sheep of his pasture. Sheep are found in sheepfold. Human beings are found on earth. And Jesus is saying that anybody who enters this earth by another door, how do we enter this, this life? Through being born here. That is what gives you the legal right to pray. That is why when you die, we don't expect to see you walking around Costco. It's gone. Your body is over. You are a spirit, but you live in a body. And what allows you to live here is your body. What allows astronauts to operate in space is their space suit. You have an earth suit that you operate in. That makes you legal. That is why when God wanted to come here and operate, the Bible says that he prepared, the book of Hebrews concerning Jesus, he prepared a body for him. Because spirits don't have the legal rights. It's human beings who have the legal right. So you find out in the Gospels that many times the enemy will try to find out what God was doing here. So he will ask Jesus, Oh, son of the Most High, what are you doing here? Have you come to destroy us before the time? They know a time is coming. Even, even devils know that a day is coming for judgment and Christians don't care. And so when you clap your hands, you are telling Satan that I am legal here. And I have the ability to operate here. And you are illegal here. So when you clap your hands. Did, did it, did it, didn't our Lord Jesus say in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43, I guess. He said, when an unclean spirit leaves a person, a man, a woman. It goes around dry places seeking rest and finding none. Says, I will return to my former house. Which means. Demons and devils find expression through human agency. If nobody cooperates with them, their works are limited. So the one who has decided they don't like you, there's a spirit. 
It's not them. Pity them. Just shake your head and say, I just pity you. You are allowing something to use you. Jesus looked at one of the most loyal people to him and he looked at him in the eye and said, get behind me, Satan. Peter wasn't Satan, but there was a Satan using Peter's mouth to talk nonsense. So when you clap your hands, you establish this. Number four, when we clap our hands, it's an act of warfare. And some of you didn't know that. I said clapping is an act of warfare. You, you didn't hear me at all. In, listen, listen. In Job chapter 27, in Job chapter 27, and verse number 23, concerning the enemy, concerning the devil, the enemy, listen to what he says. He says, men shall clap their hands at him and hiss him out of his place. So when we come to prayer meetings and the topic says now, Lord, as I clap and as I pray, you know what? Your clapping and your hissing is moving him out of his place. It is an act of, oh, somebody didn't hear me. I said it is an act of warfare. We clap foul spirits away. We hiss them out of our marriages. We clap them off our finances. We clap health. We clap them off our mind. We clap them off. Clap them off. Clap them off. Clap your hands. It is an act of warfare. So when you are praying and you are clapping, you are hissing the enemy out. Why do we shout? Why do we shout? Thirteen times in the holy writ of God, we are commanded to shout to God. Thirteen times. It says shout. The word shout let, let, me, let me explain that, then I'll give you two reasons, then I'll sit down. Have you learned anything right now? Some of you will be going to work, and at work you'll be clapping. And somebody's going to ask you, why are you clapping? And you, say, you tell them, you don't understand, you don't get it. If I, do you really want to know? <laughs> A pastor asked the children in, in his Sunday school that, how did Israel cross the Red Sea? And people were writing, the little boy was just sitting. And pastor said, you are not writing? He said, pastor, if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> he said, no, tell me, Johnny. He said, pastor, if I told you, you would not believe it. He said, why? He said, pastor, you are old. <laughs> if I told you how Israel crossed that thing, you just won't get it. You read it, the old, old version. The new version is that Moses called the special ops. You know? And they draw behind enemy lines. And they call for seal six to come in and, and the engineer, engineer division of, of the fourth battalion. And they built a pontoon to... Pro <laughs> so at work, when they ask you why you clap, you tell them, if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you just wouldn't believe that you are clapping for... <laughs> but listen, the word shout, somebody say shout. Yeah. In the Hebrew is the word teruach. Ruach is breath. And so a shout is something you give breath to. And it means to make a joyful sound. It's a cry of jubilee, freedom. It is an ear-splitting noise that cannot be ignored. That is a shout. The first reason why we shout is that it helps us to overcome any odds against us. And you and I have, sometimes we have odds against us. Things are stacked against us. And you may not know, but God will take your shout and turn some things around. Yeah. This coming week, we'll be dealing with this man called Gideon, the son of Joash. And Gideon was lifted by God to lead Israel to fight the Midianites. And Gideon went to town and said, anybody who's ready to fight, come with me. And 32,000 men joined themselves to him. Please listen to me carefully. There's a revelation here. God looked at the 32,000 people and God knows the heart of people. And God said to Gideon, they are too many. I can't go to war with too many people because if I do that and they win, they will take their glory to themselves. You see, sometimes God will let your back be to the wall. When you are down to nothing, then you know that God is up to something. When Gideon said anybody who is afraid and wants to go home, the Bible says that 22,000 people left. Which means not everybody who is with you is for you. You didn't hear me. I, 
Now, please don't look at anybody. Look straight at me. Look straight. I said, not, not everybody who is with you is for you. There's a test. If somebody, if you say you have a friend and you haven't tested the person, your friendship is not tested. The friendship must come under test. Some of you, oh, Pastor, I'm in madly love, I'm in love, I'm in love. Really? You haven't been tested yet. Once upon a time, when I used to do premarital counseling, when people come to me and you can you, you, they just can't have enough of themselves. They even bring it to praise and worship. I can't live without you. And you know you are not talking about God. You know it. You are not talking about God. I want more of you. You know, you know, you know, you know it's not Jesus you are talking about. Well, that's the first question I ask them is, have you fought yet? So, no, pastor, no, we haven't fought. We are in love. How can we fight? Pastor, we are all over. Really? I said, can you get out from my office? Go. After you have fought your first fight, now let's come and let's talk. Will every honest person say? Yeah. What was I saying before I... God said 10,000, too many. And so he brought them, you, you remember the test he gave to them about people who would lap the water and those who would, and so only 300 men were left. And God said, with these 300 men, I would destroy the Midianites. The story goes that Gideon had a plan from the presence of the Lord. And he said, listen, I want you to watch me and do as I do. Get some pictures. That talks about your natural body. And put flames of fire in them. That talks about the Holy Spirit. It works in concert with a broken body. He said, when the pictures are broken and the light comes forth, then shout. And you see what the Lord will do. And when it happened, and Gideon shouted and said, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And they broke the pictures and they shouted. The Bible says that the Midianites became terrified. And they fled on their horses and their camels. And Israel had a wonderful victory. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you have been surrounded by some spiritual Midianites. Uh, but God is saying that in the midst of that trouble, uh, if you will break the, the... The picture is an earthen vessel. And the Bible says we have a treasure in earthen vessels. Your body is an earthen vessel. Break it. Break the pride. Break the... Break, break the all the thinner. Uh, and let the light of God come uh, and ask some shout and see what the Lord will do. Number two, then I'm beginning to finish. It allows you to overthrow barriers. I have got me some barriers and I need them overthrown. I said I've, it helps you to overthrow some barriers. Let me tell you something, people of God. There are some things in this life that your intellect, your degrees, your makeup, your Brazilian hair, your weave can handle. There are some things when they come against you, you know that this is a specially selected thing against you. And I'm going to preach to you in 10 minutes. Then I'm going to sit down. The Bible says in the book of Joshua chapter 6, all of the chapter, you read it, you know the story, you've heard about it. It has to do with Joshua. Somebody say Joshua. Joshua was leading the children of Israel. And in, in, in Joshua chapter 6 verse number 1, the Bible says that now the gates of Jericho were securely shut. Because of the children of Israel. Somebody hear me. It says the gates of Jericho were shut. Because of the children of Israel. Nobody came in and nobody went out. You know the story. Moses had brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. They, and they were on their journey to the promised land. Let me digress a little bit and talk to somebody as a pastor. Let me teach you something. You are battling with something. You are calling the demon. But I'll show you what the real demon is today. The people came out of Egypt. The Bible says in the book of Exodus that when they came out, they came out with great substance. But part of the baggage were not in gold or silver or clothing or anything. Part of the baggage and probably the heaviest baggage that Israel came out of Egypt with was between their two ears. Their mentality. They had been slaves for 430 years. So their thinking and their everything was a slave thinking. That is why in order to deliver them, listen to me carefully somebody. In order to deliver them, God had to bring somebody who was not part of the slavery culture. Moses 
had to be adopted in a palace so he can think like a king. Listen, you cannot operate as a king when you, be, when you continually think like a, a, a slave. Your thinking is very important. Your thinking determines where you go to. Some of you have stinking thinking. That is why I came this morning. When you have stinking thinking, listen, you have stinking living. As he thinks in his heart, Proverbs 23, 7, so you see, your thinking is powerful. How many of you own computers, laptops, iPads, smartphones, anybody? And uh, who has ever had a computer that has, that has been corrupted by a virus before? When it's corrupted, what do you do? You get antivirus, whatever, Norton, or Maki, you know that thing? And you devirus it. If, in, you know what I'm talking about? Now, even if you don't know, pretend like you understand what is going on. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Some of you have viruses in your mind. Virus of fear. Virus of insecurity. Virus of rejection. Vi vi virus of little, little thinking. Virus of, of, of all kinds of things. And I have come with a spiritual anti de virus to devirus you. Some of you, I need to, de 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 to deworm you and to deprogram you in order to reprogram you so that you can begin to function according to what God Almighty has for you. You have put in too much junk and whenever you put junk in, junk comes out. That is I hope you have enjoyed this telecast. There's an information on the screen if you want to get in touch with us. In fact, we would really love to hear from you. So just write to us, send us an email, send us a message, and let us know how much we can also keep blessing you. I pray for you that God Almighty will order your ways. He will bless you. He will keep you. He will secure you. He will make you the best ever. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.